Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. A vegetable garden can provide food, but it can also leave a gardener with lots of questions. Today we are answering some. It's the Q&A show next on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Whether it's problems with peppers, disease that wipes out your crops, or soil issues, there always seems to be a puzzling problem in the home vegetable garden. That happened to some of our viewers last season, and they sent us their questions. Today, we're answering them. Hopefully our answers will help you too. Let's start with a question about leeks. My leeks are growing well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what should I do to get them to fully mature with thick stalks? I thought about using hay to shade them. Will this work? When should I expect them to be ready for harvest? And this is Brian from Powell, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So, if you know anything about leeks, <laughs> leeks are... <laughs> So no, I do not. Related, you know, uh, to uh, onions. I actually know some folks, you know, who grow leeks. Oh, good. Uh, I'm going to let you Shelby curious. Shelby County Community Gardens. Yeah, I'm going to let you curious uh, on this right. leek situation. So, you know, the thing about the leeks is going to be this. I answered the, the, the last question first, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at about 100 to 120 days to full maturity. Okay, that's a long, that's a long time that you got to be watching these leeks grow. That's a long time. So this is what one of those gardeners told me, and I listen to these seasoned gardeners who've yes. been around for a while, right? So he uses transplants, okay? So when he plants them in the ground, he plants half of the leeks in the ground. Half okay. of the leek transplants in the ground. So you have half in the ground, half up top. Okay. As it starts to grow, guess what he does? He uses the soil to heal up that around area it. around the leeks. Okay. Right. Which allows, you know, for more growth mm -hmm. and also for blanching, right? Blanching is good, you know, for nutrition. Okay. Know. That helps um, what turn it white? Helps to turn it white. Okay. So that's what it's for, right? So this is what, you know, a couple of those gardeners like to do. And it seems to work. It seems to work. It seems to work. So, so they, it sounds like his thought about maybe using hay. So using hay could work to I help think, blanch. I think it could work. Okay. Right? But you're going to be doing some healing up, you mm -hmm. know, the soil up against the leeks themselves, right? And when you Which said, allows for better growth. When you said the season was so long, so 120 days, and then he was concerned about them not like getting really thick stalks. Yeah. Maybe they're just not mature enough. Maybe they're not mature enough to sh to have those. Maybe they're not mature enough. I mean, that's something to think stalks. about, right? Because yeah. again, you got to be patient, you know. And I'm sure they probably have some, uh, you know, varieties that are probably early. Mm. You know, you probably 60, you know, 80 days or something like that. But for the most part, uh, the ones that I know that grow in this area, pretty much 100 to 120 days. Yeah. And these folks have been growing them forever. Yeah. Uh, right. But that's the method they use. And okay. it seems to work. But yeah, patience is involved. So you're right. Maybe he's just not letting them mature enough. I'm going to branch out and try some leeks. Try some leeks. I, mean, I bet you had it before and didn't realize you were eating <laughs> leeks. Right. But they are good. All right, so Brian, thank you much for that question. We appreciate that. Yeah, so using the hay we think could work. Yeah. Right, but you definitely have to heal up the soil around those leaks, right, for full maturity. My okra plants were producing good fruit regularly, but now the flower buds don't even open. What is going on? This is sold on YouTube. Well, look, I know you like okra plants, don't you? Man, I, but I'm just surprised about the okra plant. We had the okra plant in our yard, and nothing happened to it. It just stayed. I just want, I be want something that happened to my okra plant. I ain't even got that and, and, and pick it. It's so tough um, to pick. It's hard, but but I, 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 I don't know that bee could be heat in there, cause yeah. me to do that in there. But uh, but okra plant is a really little tough plant for me in the landscape and it's in your garden. So I, I don't know. Yeah, Elena, it's probably heat stress. Heat you know, that's what I'm thinking about because yeah, anytime we have hot, dry weather. And the temperatures here, specifically in Memphis, have been above, you know, of course, 90 degrees. Right. So, yeah, the flower production is going to decline, mm -hmm. you know, just due to heat, right? What you can do, though, you can actually cut that okra plant back above the soil line 6 to 12 inches, right? You can get a fall, fall crop. crop. Mm -hmm. Fall crop. Fall crop, right? Yeah. 
there's bad news and good news. Yeah, so it's bad news, good news. The, the, right. The bad news, you can't do anything about the heat, but yeah. the good news is you can look forward to fall, and, mm -hmm. and it's and it's going to cool off eventually. It and is, eventually. If we could just even get the nighttime temps up, you know, mm -hmm. or as 80 degrees, 90 degrees at yeah. night, it's still they're under a lot of stress. Right, because, yeah, the plant is steady working mm -hmm. 24 hours a day when the temperatures are so, you know, warm at night. It'll get a chance to... <sighs> it really It'll get better. Yeah, It'll cool off. Right? Yeah. Cool off no. yeah, yeah, they can't cool off like that. So that's what I think that is, environmental stress, mm -hmm. which is going to be heat stress, heat right? Stress. Which is going to cause the flower production again to decline, yeah, almost right. shut off. Mm -hmm. right? Like I said, it, it, we've been staying hot at night. It, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's not getting a break. The plant not getting a break. You know, right. It's hot in the daytime, hot at night. So that's the problem. It's working it's itself, itself, itself to death. You know, it can't hardly, mm -hmm. it can survive in there. If you do water, you do water your oak plant. Try to do it early in the morning time. Right, in, right. In, in, in there, but that's a tough little plant, though. Right. Know? Yeah. So consistent watering, mm -hmm, you know, as yeah. well. But yeah, just look forward to a fall crop, though. That's good. You know, that's yeah. what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't, you shouldn't be able to kill it. So no, it should, no, you it shouldn't should, be able to. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll make it through. It'll, it'll make it through, yeah. What's a collard green plant that resists bugs? And this is Joe. Wouldn't we all like plants that resist <laughs> <Yes>. bugs? <laughs> all right. So, so Lee, what you think about that? Is there a collard green plant that resists bugs? I don't know of a I... collard green plant itself that resists <laughs> bugs or a variety that uh, would resist bugs. I don't think that's has been developed yet. Mm. Yeah, maybe we need to get on that, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Ken, what do you think about that? That would be great. Wouldn't that be great? Could, yeah, yeah. That'd maybe so they can, great. you know, the genetics, they can breed that into it. But I think the insects adapt. If you change, uh, they change. Uh, so, they change, too. Yeah. It, it would be nice to have a collard green plant that could do yeah. that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we know what the, the cabbage looper, the cabbage worm, the aphids. harlequin bug, the aphids. Yeah. Oh, they're going to come. Yep. They're, they're going to come, uh, for sure. Just plant enough for them, I Just guess. Just plant enough. <laughs> so, yeah, plant your, your, your flash, your, your champion uh, variety of uh, collard greens, you'll be fine. Right. Right, you'll be fine. So what is the best way to treat, like, you had aphids, you know, your collard greens? You could use some of the uh, horticulture oils. Yeah. Uh, would be a good way to try to control sure. them. Sure, sure. And if you, you know, for the cabbage worm, the cabbage looper, BT. BT. Right, yeah. javelin, diapel, just read and follow the label. You know, give them a stomach ache, they go away. They die, but yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. We get a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, breed a collard green plant that can resist bugs, Joe. So we'll, we'll get on that for you, all right? I planted peaches and cream corn, which is good. Oh, love I it. bought at the local feed store and not one came up. I planted it again and again the same thing. What's going on? I have grown corn there before. I put triple tin down first. And this is Richard from Greenville, Tennessee. The uh, corn is not coming up. It's not coming up. He seeded. It, it's not coming up. I feel your pain <laughs> because you know you huh? think, well, I can start put planting warm season vegetables after the middle of April mm -hmm. because it's time. It's time. It should but be the time. weather this spring and the last last few springs has been cold. And I did that mistake. I said, oh, I'm going to get ahead because I want to get corn growing. Mm -hmm. So I planted seeds, and it was too cold, and they, they did not come up. And if, it was peaches and cream, too. Peaches so, and cream is good. Yeah. If the soil is too damp and too, too damp, cold. Too damp and too cold, yeah. The you, seeds will not it will, it won't. you you got to <laughs> wait till the soil temperature is at least 70 degrees. Corn likes it warm. Corn likes it hot. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely have to have yeah, warmer soil temperatures. Yeah. And, and, and it can yeah. be wet. And yeah, and it, it can, definitely can be wet. I mean, it can be moist, but not wet. Yeah, just right out the roots. Yeah. yeah. So again, yeah, if it's cold, the soil is damp. Eh, and, it, and, and what happened is, is they probably rot it in the ground before probably. the temperature was correct for them to germinate. Probably. Yep. So that's what I'm thinking happened. That's definitely what I'm thinking happened. So you're going to have to plant a little later. Mr. Richard, mm -hmm. yeah, wait till that soil warms up, you know, 70 degrees or more. Just make sure it's well drained, of course. Yep. And, and if he's planted there before, I'm hoping he's ro rotating his crops, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, So he's not planting corn in the same place yeah. every year. Yeah, So, yeah, because yeah, I don't plant. I have I, I have square, and I just, every few right. years, I move the corn around. Right. Now, that's a, that's a good point. And something else I like to mention, too, using the triple 10. 
Is that according to the soil test? Yeah, yeah so I was going to say, sure. you, make yeah, sure you no. need a soil test because I, my garden wasn't doing well and I got a soil test and I realized that all I needed was nitrogen because the other right. uh, phosphorus and potassium were very high. Yeah. I didn't need that. So all I needed was nitrogen. And once I did that and stopped putting you know, other products on there, the, the garden did a lot better. Yeah. It makes a difference. Yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. does. I mean, we say it a lot, but we mean it because yes. it does you know, make a difference. It, for it sure. helps. Right. pH is all about nutrient availability. So. Yeah, make sure you get that soil tested, uh, Mr. Richard. But yeah, we're thinking, yeah, cold. It was too cold. Damp soils. And too wet. Yeah, this has been a very unusual spring. The last couple of years, like yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, it has. Hi, Chris. Every year we plant tomatoes, yellow squash, and cucumbers. They seem to always have a limited growing season of about three weeks. Mm. Tomatoes and cucumbers grow the first part of July, then wilt and die after three weeks of bearing. I just put down three yards of certified compost and I tried to get indeterminate plants. Also, I'm keeping up with daily watering in the hot days, but careful not to overwater. What's up? And how can I extend the production season up to frost if possible? Mm -hmm. Many thanks. And this is John from Columbia, South Carolina. So it's good that he, he's trying to grow you yeah. know, all these different vegetables. But here's the thing, Celeste, tomatoes and cucumbers, they will wilt mm -hmm. and die. They so will. what do we think about the tomato first? Okay, we'll talk about the let's tomato. go with tomatoes first. Yeah. So from the picture that we saw, yeah. this looks um, very similar to um, a blight called yes. early blight yes. that we see on tomatoes. And it's a little confusing because it, it's called early blight, <laughs> yes. but it doesn't always right. happen early in the season. <laughs> right, They're right. like, it can't be early blight. It, we're, we're in <laughs> July. Right. And I'm like, that. don't get caught up yeah, in the terminology. Exactly right. <laughs> so that's just what we call it. Um, it is soil borne, so mm -hmm. like water, it could, when it rains, it can splash up mm -hmm. from the soil onto the bottom leaves. You'll start seeing death happening uh, on those leaves nearest the, the ground on the yeah. plant and it'll work its way up. And, and there's a, a small degree of this that's gonna happen eventually yes. on the tomatoes. A lot of people call that firing up. Yes, it looks like I've they've been that. fired up from yeah. the bottom, you know. Mm -hmm. But we d certainly don't want this disease to take out your plants that early in the season before they've had time to really produce a good harvest for you. So the best way to manage that is to start early before any signs of uh, foliar damage really are showing with preventative applications hey. of fungicide. Mm -hmm. The fungicides that are available to homeowners are not curative in nature. So once you see signs of disease on the bottom, we'll say two sets of leaves, you can count on those leaves falling off. Yes, you can. <laughs> but when you spray it with the fungicide, you're protecting the leaves that haven't already been exposed to those uh, fungal spores. Good. So. Um, that would be my best recommendation for that is just start early start with early. a plan to have preventative fungicide sprays on your tomatoes every okay. two weeks and something according else, to label. Yeah, <laughs> according to label and something else I like to add to that, mulch. Yes, oh yeah, that would, that would be good. Mulch. That's going to help prevent splash up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Use a mulch yeah, of some sort. Mulch. Okay, so what about the cucumbers? What do you think about that? The cucumbers, while it looks similar, because they're both wilting and <laughs> right and, and turning yellow and drying up, that is being caused from a, a completely different situation. Most likely feeding from cucumber beetles that has a vectored um, bacterial wilt mm -hmm. to those plants. Yep. Super common, Yes. nothing that this person is doing wrong. The cucumber beetles are in our environment. I've even, was telling you earlier, been noticing them on yeah. all kinds of plants in my garden. Not that they're hurting my flowers, yeah. but I'll be out there working around and I'm like, what's that cucumber beetle doing over here? <laughs> the garden's over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, definitely we need to spray to control those cucumber beetles mm -hmm. so that uh, we don't vector that, that disease and get the decline, um, early decline of our plants. Yep. Yeah, those, those would help. Those would definitely help. Yeah. So just do some scouting. Yeah. Scouting. Right, scout different. around. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you know what you're looking for as far as insects go so that you know how to time, time your applications. Exactly right. And something else I'd like to mention as well, how about resistant varieties? Could there be some resistant varieties out there for your tomatoes? Yeah, there certainly yeah. can. So yeah. when you buy a tomato plant and you look at the tag, yeah. it, it'll have all these strange capital letter, <laughs> yeah. look like acronym abbreviations. Yeah. And those stand for a variety of different yeah. diseases. So, um, you know, 
TSWV is tomato spotted wilt virus, right. EB is early blight, yeah. LB, late blight, and it goes on and on. There's yeah. lots of diseases of tomatoes, um, but certainly check those, check those tags and see if you know that you're, you've been struggling with early blight, see if you can find one that has some resistance with that. I'm thinking this is a cucumber beetle, but I'm not sure. It is really destroying my garden. Would you know a non-pesticide way to get rid of them? And this is Mike from Buckley, Washington. So thank you for that picture, Mike. Yeah. That picture you had there. Is it a cucumber beetle? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, yes. Okay. But how would you get rid of it? Yeah. Non-pesticide way. Uh, non -pesticide I would way. like, I would smash it. <laughs> so you were fine. I'd pick you it were, off and I would smash it. You would smash it. Okay. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a, a lot of the, you can use pyrethroids and stuff like that, but you have to actually get them on. Yeah, you got to contact the beetle. Yeah, the right. contact beetle. And mm -hmm. sometimes you don't see them. Yeah. Because yeah. the problem is they'll bite the, the uh, vegetable and then they transfer the, the wilts. Yeah, the, the bacteria. bacteria. Yeah. The bacterial wilts. Mm -hmm. And oh my goodness. And when that That's happens. That's what just, it's, yeah. everything's gone, yeah. It's a downhill from there. So I don't, you know, other than that, um, the pyrethroids. I yeah, don't. you can do the pyrethroids. I, but, uh, but neem see, see, oil, but again, it has neem, to be there for yeah, you to contact you have, it. If right. you have neem oil and you don't want to smash it, you can just trace them around and spray them. <laughs> spray them. But I right. mean, it, it, like contact insecticides are probably the least uh, uh, lethal way to do that, and yeah. they're hard to catch. Right. Yeah, because they, you know, they can move pretty rapidly and they can fly. Yeah. Uh, so those would be pretty tough to use. Um, but there are none pesticide ways to control. There's a couple other things, right? Mm -hmm. So you can use floating row covers. Oh, that's right? true. So you can yeah. cover, you cover know, the plants. Up. But then the thing about it is you have to remove the row cover once the plant in bloom. That's so true because you, you want the bees to pollinate right. it. So you want to get pollinated. So let's think about the floating uh, row covers. Something else that you can do is you can plant late. How about planting later? Yeah. Okay. Or how about a trap crop? Just talk about that. So you just plant something else, you know, and just let them have at that while you have this over here. Yeah. Uh, so that's something else you could do. Or resistant varieties. Wait, yeah, yeah. And, and if there are any out there, have, do a little research. A cucumber, the cucumber beetle can bite them, and they can have the, but they are the plant that it's biting is resistant to mm -hmm. the bacterial wilt. Yep. And so at you, least you have the plant. You, you, at least you have your plant yeah. and your fruits and stuff. Yeah. So I mean, those are some of the things I would consider. You know, uh, if you, you know, don't want to use neem oil, the pyrethroids, uh, or yeah, touch I'll, them. Uh, yeah, or touch them. Uh, but the floating roll covers, you mm -hmm. know, something's good. Resistant varieties, you can find that. Trap crop, you know, let them eat something else, or just plant later. You know, because by the time the larva matures, becomes an adult, that's early in the season, so they find some else to eat, yep. and then you can have. You know, yes. what you need in your own garden there, Mike. So uh, thank you for that question. And if you have any other questions about that, yeah, do check with your local extension office there. They may have some publications. Yeah, and they may they have a, control. a good timing for yeah, him it, also. Exactly. It sure may. What is this stuff growing on the bottom of my tomatoes? And this is Jerome from Millington, <laughs> Tennessee. So what do you think about that, Doc? On the bottom, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we all grow tomatoes. Yeah, yeah, he had a picture. He had a picture. So, so yeah. I think we all kind of agreed after we saw it, it was blossom in rot. Right, mm -hmm. Yeah, blossom Which in is right. really, really common, you know, yeah, especially common. with our up and down water and yeah. rain and, you know, so that's a problem that is only remedied with regular watering and making sure you've got the pH right. That's right, exactly So that right. calcium can be uptake because there's a lack of calcium. Lack of calcium, yeah. I would recommend mulching. You know, mm. it's real to help regulate, you know, That's soil true. moisture. That's true. That would be a good, yeah. Uh, for sure. Anything you want to add to that, Mr. John? Yeah, this is, yeah, definitely common. Yeah. No, it's definitely common. No, yeah. I think yeah. you covered it. Oh, and it's not just tomatoes, you know. You can get it on oh, squash yeah. and watermelons squash. Right. and cucumbers and all kind of you things. Sure yeah. But typically, point. I think... Most commonly, people realize that's what it is on the tomatoes. It's on yeah. the tomatoes, yeah. Yep. It's the lack of calcium when that fruit is starting to develop and enlarge. We live near farm fields. Is there anything you can do to protect garden tomatoes from farm herbicides? And this is Clarence from Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Get that question a lot around this way, especially in the Millington area. 
Yeah. yeah so I'm, very, I'm sure you're very familiar with some of those questions. I am. Uh -huh. I am. And, you know, I've worked in the industry. And, I know you have. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, worked with farmers and, and worked with homeowners. And uh, uh, I have a sister, Charlotte, lives over in Carothersville, Missouri, okay. and, and she's unable to grow tomatoes. She's not been able to grow tomatoes for the last several years. Uh, my my suggestion is to talk to the farmer. I see if you can what, identify. Yeah, think, see yeah. if you can identify where, yeah. uh, which farmer, and you, if you know which field it's coming from. Go talk to the farmer and just tell them that you like to grow tomatoes, and and it may uh, affect the crops that he plants oh. close to your house. Okay. He may completely change so that he's not using one of the herbicides that is very. The tomatoes are very susceptible oh, to. Uh, yeah. That may do that. Uh, uh, he may offer to pay you for the tomatoes if you've lost some. And I know uh, Clarence is probably not interested in that. Yeah. He's probably not interested in being paid for them. He just wants to be able to grow tomatoes. Most people like homegrown tomatoes. Yeah. But that's the first thing I'd do. I'd go talk to the farmer. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a, a you know, confrontational sure, situation. Sure, just sure. say, hey, you know, you know, I know he probably knows him. They're right. probably friends. They right. may go to church together. Right. Just say, man, you know, I sure am having trouble growing tomatoes now for some reason. I don't know what the problem is. And, and you know, uh, but th that's the best way to handle that. Uh, I like that. Uh, you know, I do. Mm -hmm. talk communication and, and see if you can work something out. Right. Yeah, but I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, if you just communicate, you know, with the farmer, maybe that helps. Yeah, it may change. He may, he may simply, you know, we'll plant something else there where we won't have to use it, one right. of those products. I want to transplant my strawberries to a raised bed. I then got concerned about freeze risk. How long before a frost do I need to move my strawberries? And this is Kevin from Paola, Kansas, Mr. D. So he wants to transplant those strawberries, right? Before the frost. Before the frost. Before the frost. And, and you know, and strawberries are perennial, so they can stand cold weather. They they kind of go dormant in the winter time. And and uh, 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 I in Paola, Kansas, I would look around and try to figure out when the commercial guys are planting their strawberries, and that's when I would transplant mine. Uh, and it may be four weeks before the. Uh, average killing frost mm -hmm. or something like that. Give them, give them a little chance to to get some, have some root development. The commercial guys are just planting crowns, mm -hmm. and uh, right. they're not putting, you know, live plants out there. Uh, they are live plants, but they're just the strawberry crowns. So uh, uh, that might, you know, be a little factor. You may want to, may want to go uh, a little bit earlier. I don't know. Uh, so that, this is not something that's typically done. You know, most of the time, you might want to consider getting some strawberry crowns and putting them in the raised beds and leaving these alone. You know, I don't know how many you're talking about doing. Right. You may have better luck, you know, starting out with crowns rather than a whole plant. Hmm. And, you know, that's I've, interesting. I've had a lot of bad luck transplanting whole plants. Uh, the larger they are, they're a, harder they are for me to get to live when I'm planting a bare root plant. Uh, and that goes for trees, shrubs, or anything. If I go with a small one, you know, I, I, I have a lot better luck than I do with a large one. So, so I don't know. That's just kind of a different kind of question. But, you know, four weeks, two to four weeks before killing frost, you know, if you've done, a, if, you, if you know, I'll do the trick for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully she can you dig enough soil with the roots that she's transplanting so that it will be less of a shock for yeah. them to transplant also. Right. And, right. you know, and mulch it when you and get done. It. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say water it. Yeah, make sure yeah. you get it watered water in. Water it in. Yeah. Good. Water and it mulch in. it. And then roots mulch it. Right. And see what happens. Yep. See what happens. We love fresh peppers in our Hungarian hot Jalapenos mm -hmm. and sweet Italian peppers did well, but the habaneros took so long to mature that we lost most of them to the frost. Some of that was probably due to a very cold, wet spring. How can I improve their yields? I took these pictures right before the first frost. And this is Eric and Sharon in Pasco, Washington. Oh, okay. uh, so we have to think about that. Yeah, Washington, yeah. Right? So, um, okay. so it is true that our bells, our jalapenos, 
are we're going to be able to get to fruiting sooner on those. Okay. So a lot of those hots, you know, we may have a longer season. So I would think about it in terms of, you know, a range of can we get in earlier in uh, the spring, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So they referenced a cool, wet spring, which yeah. actually we experienced here in <laughs> Tennessee. It was quite still, often. Yeah, 2022 was the latest yeah. that I ever got into um, the spring season. So. Are there things that can help you get in earlier? Raise beds that drain faster. Okay. Mm. You know, so some of those sites may be able to give you a little bit of a window. The other thing is, and when I think about hot peppers, especially ones that you're probably not going to use in a huge volume, uh -huh. you don't need that many plants. Maybe this is a container okay. option okay. that it would allow you to get in yeah. early. You could protect later in the season to get a longer mm -hmm growing season. I know some hot pepper aficionados who will overwinter their peppers mm. so that they have a more mature plant starting okay. earlier. These are obviously, these would be folks with okay. greenhouses <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, right. and things like that. I thought so, you were going to say crazy peppers. <laughs> well, in, I, I wouldn't call any <laughs> vegetable <laughs> enthusiast crazy. crazy. Right? <laughs> but, yeah, there, are, um, there are ways that you can extend the growing season, I think yeah. containers and, yeah. and would idea. be would be one of the things that I would I would go to. Okay, that's good. So, last anything yeah. you want to add to that? Nope, <laughs> nope, we're good. Yeah, we let those crazy yeah, <laughs> no. vegetable folks yeah. out. Yeah, crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah. pepper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is good. So, uh, Eric and Sharon, thank you for that question. Yeah, Pasco, Washington, right? Yeah. So, container. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's your option there. Appreciate that. Keep going earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. early. Yeah, I yeah. do like that. I like that. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for sending in the questions. They keep us on our toes. If you want to find research-based information to help you in your garden this coming year, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have well over a thousand videos and with each one, links to extension publications from all over the country. Thanks for watching, I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.